we're going to have our four panelists give five minute lightning talks. And the, the goal there is so you can understand kind of where they're coming from, what their world is like, um, know a little bit more about them before we do the panel. And then we'll do kind of a traditional panel. We'll have some questions, um, some of which we thought about ahead of time, some of which will be in kind of reaction to what they share. Uh, and then we'll have time for Q&A, the audience. And without further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Sonali Shield is the product manager of Walmart Labs. We started doing that in 2018 uh, when he came on, uh, but our expo service has been around for two years. So we have kind of two big main types of tests we run, um, and I'll also talk about a couple others that are very specific to Walmart being a very heavy operational business as well. Uh, but we do our tests to learn, which is something where we really have uh, the ability to learn if something is performing better than a production experience. So an example of that would be we launched Guest Heart for an e-commerce site. So the ability to add things to your basket without signing in, uh, it was a massive success at Walmart. Um, we saw crazy, crazy GMB impact revenue impact from it. Um, but this was, a, this was a test we ran where we said, okay, the control experience, user cannot add to cart um, unless they have an account access. In the variation experience they could add to part if um, if they were signed out, they were an option user. So that was something that we went through three or four iterations on. We had all kinds of learnings um, before we were actually able to launch it. We weren't able to launch it until we could prove that we were doing no harm to conversion and revenue. Um, we also do tests to launch. These are sort of business-driven tests, but things that we don't want to get out um, without kind of mitigating risk. So we'll do a 10%, 50%, 100% rollout. Um, we probably will launch it no matter what. Um, we just want to make sure we're doing no harm to the business. We want to make sure it's behind the CCM flags. We can turn it off if you know major bugs are um, introduced. An example of that would be uh, ADA. We were uh, in a bit of trouble with the ADA compliance laws, uh, and so we had to change a lot of the color contrast on our site. And so uh, it was something we had to do by a certain time, but we still tested into it because we wanted to make sure changing the color of an add to cart button from orange to blue was not going to significantly change our um, conversion. Outside of this, I, will, I would also say we do store-based rollouts. So a lot of our features are very operational heavy. So I'll give you an example of that. Like, uh, we launched a smart substitutions offer. So in the grocery business, uh, a lot of our problems are around inventory and availability. So when you order uh, a pack of apples, we might have not have that exact quantity, but we want to give you maybe another quantity or um, another brand of it. Uh, and so we launched this feature that basically allowed um, the associates, when they were doing their pick walks around a grocery store at a Walmart, um, to get a smart suggestion of what like alternative they could pick if that item was out of stock. 
Um, so this, is, this was kind of like a shared software experience as well as sort of operational experience. And it wasn't something that we could just launch to 10% of traffic across the United States. We had to start at specific stores because we had to train them and get kind of like operational feedback on a store-by-store -store basis. So we also run store-based tests um, and then we do, once in a while, do pre-post tests as well. Um, if the traffic isn't high enough, then we won't be able to really like uh, assess the impact of something. Because it's such a small change, we'll just do a launch and we'll test the impact of it pre and post. But these are the sort of major ways that we use experimentation. At Walmart, we have a pretty strict process. Uh, around A-B testing, so as a product manager, if I want to run a test, I have to sort of be very clear about why I'm running the test, the purpose of it, um, what I'm trying to achieve. Um, I have to be very specific about what KPIs I'm driving, and uh, this, this is not just, you know, I want to launch this and I think conversion will go up. It's got to be sort of very specific to the feature. Um, so if I'm launching something on a specific page, it might be add to cart on a specific page. Um, and I basically am committing in this test plan that we have to create that uh, I will not launch unless these KPIs, which I'm committing um, to thinking are going to change, will, will, will actually, or if, if uh, when they actually do change, is when I do get to launch. Um, so yeah, so then we create a test plan, and then we have a final readout. Our tool does allow for sort of real-time monitoring, so we have a UI where we can kind of see every day I go in and I check my tests, and I check how it's doing from the GMB standpoint. Um, although you have to be very careful there, you have to wait until you have enough traffic, because things can be very noisy. So that's a little bit about our process. Um, oh, and then I wanted to go through just a, a quick state case study with you. So this was a test I ran last year. Um, so in this test, uh, it was an Android-specific test, and what I was trying to do was unify the navigation between iOS and Android. Um, iOS is a very traditional bottom navigation structure. Android, for the longest time, didn't have a component like that in its material design library, uh, but it introduced one, and so I decided that we should move to a bottom navigation structure to kind of unify our native app experience and make our design and engineering more efficient. We were moving from native apps to React Native, and so we wanted to make sure designs between Android and iOS were fairly consistent. Um, I also thought that it was more usable. I mean, our control experience uh, was, cra was crazy, I thought. Uh, you can see there's like white text, and that's how a user can navigate between the different pages, and it was hidden sort of in this like uh, lime, lemon, bell pepper image, <laughs> and uh, I didn't think it was very usable. Search is where most of our ad parts come from, and the only way you can access search is like finding that little magnifying glass and clicking on it. So uh, we decided to run the same test. When I first ran it, um, I said, okay, I don't, uh, my, my KPIs are gonna be overall ad cart and initiate checkout, um, because uh, those were the ones that I thought would be impacted specifically by this navigation. And it said, you know, we'll launch because if we see no negative impact on these two metrics. Uh, and let's see, what do you guys think happened? <laughs> Checkouts went through the roof. Checkouts went through the roof. I wish that happened. <laughs> uh, so in this case, we actually found, and there's this, just kind of ignore this last screen because I wanted to kind of build into that, but. Uh, we actually found that uh, homepage bounce was increasing in this variation experience. And so um, our hypothesis was that uh, in, the, in the variation experience, we didn't sort of create a discoverable enough bottom out. And what's interesting about this is we were we've kind of been drilled into us that when we make changes like this uh, between control and variation, uh, it's important to sort of isolate exactly the change. So even though the ide ideal experience is what I had here in variation two, um, I was kind of taught that, you know, don't delete the image, uh, don't do anything there, just make the change, the navigation. Um, and so we wanted to really assess the specific impact of moving the navigation. Uh, and what we found actually was that uh, customers, I think, weren't able to see the bottom line. Uh, they maybe were still looking for it in the sort of image because uh, they were used to it being there. And uh, maybe they were pulling the app and reopening it and like looking for it and they thought there was a bug. So our hypothesis was 
because it wasn't discoverable enough, and so we ended up launching variation two, uh, which kind of removed the image at the top, shaded in the icons at the bottom, and uh, we did see the positive impacts that we were hoping for. So um, actually what we ended up seeing was flat conversion in sales, which was perfect. Um, and we saw a decline in page views. So uh, I think what we learned from this test, which we wouldn't have learned without experimentation, was we were actually making shopping um, more efficient for our users because they were going and viewing less pages, but they were still checking out at the same rate and their basket size was still the same size. Um, and so this was an interesting insight that we wouldn't have gotten had we not run these two sort of variants. A time? I wasn't even looking. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think uh, these are sort of some key takeaways that, that I think that I've learned in my sort of couple of years A-B testing in the e-commerce environment. Uh, it hasn't been sort of widely an accepted uh, thing, particularly in retail. I would say um, there are teams that are very used to making changes on the website uh, via content management system or via what they think is best, particularly like in merchandising, web merchandising. And so I would say where we have to go is kind of expand this methodology and mentality across the organization and really be more strict about, um, you know, even if we are just changing the item that's on sale for the week or, you know, we're moving uh, an item from the snacks aisle to a pantry aisle, we should really measure what that's doing. Um, and be less uh, sort of gut focused around like you know what we think it will do. Uh, so I think kind of expanding these tools uh, to be available and accessible by those other business users that are not product managers is something that we need to get better at. Um, but it's been it's been sort of a, a really fun way for me to even become a better product manager. I would say uh, because it's crazy how you can have a hypothesis and. It just doesn't turn out the way you think it will until you have sort of that data that's just right there. Um, and yeah, it, it's it's been it's it's, a, it's been a very important tool for us. Um, I think that's it. All right, thank you. So uh, next up, we have Sean Reddy, data scientist at Tinder, and uh, he's going to go and share his deck. Hey everyone. Uh, I'm Sean, I'm a data scientist at Tinder, and I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, analytics and experimentation, kind of how we do that at Tinder. So uh, our, our primary purpose is to try and help people meet each other. Uh, so any way in which we can kind of conduct experiments to help, help that, uh, help enable that, is kind of like our overall goal. Uh, so we need to understand how people are using our app, and then kind of uh, very similar, similarly to how Sonali had mentioned uh, the process, we have a very similar process, uh, starting kind of at a hypothesis and then defining KPIs, um, and then actually creating a test plan and then rolling it out. So some important information for kind of some background on uh, experimentation ex explicitly at Tinder is that we kind of have to work at scale. Um, so we're the world's most popular app for meeting people, um, we have a very diverse user base. Uh, we're in pretty much every country in the world uh, in 40 different languages. Uh, and we cater to all different audiences. So we need to be able to kind of cater our product uh, to everyone's kind of unique individual experience. Um, and then we also need to be able to support um, various platforms and kind of keep that experience uh, consistent across iOS, Android, and web. So some of the segments that we will use uh, in testing, uh, we, can, we need to be able to localize for different markets, so different targeting geos or being able to release to different countries is obviously very important. Um, being able to develop something for either just iOS or Android, um, so being able to target our user base that way. Um, even people who potentially have multiple devices, we need to be able to handle that as well. Um, various versions of the app that might exist uh, whether people have older phones, sometimes we don't always um, have the latest support for the newest features on older app versions, so we need to be able to cater to that as well. And then we also have uh, state-based triggers um, that we, we need to be able to test for. Um, things like if you have a new match, that would be kind of 
uh, a prerequisite to falling into a variant or the control, uh, things like that. And then we then need to be able to analyze uh, the impact on different groups of, of users to make sure we're not kind of negatively impacting any individual segment. So different age groups, genders, gender preferences, uh, or even combinations of those are things that are very important to us in testing. So uh, yeah, within the app, some of the areas that we focus on uh, that we conduct experimentation uh, would be anything like a new feature release. Um, our recommendations algorithm is obviously very important, so we're always kind of trying to optimize that. Uh, building on your profile, uh, creating new features for privacy, trust, and safety, and then make sure that our user base uh, feels safe coming into the app uh, every time. Uh, improving navigation, uh, very similar to what Zanali was mentioning. Um, also, the chat experience is very important to us, uh, ensuring that uh, we do things like moderation, and launching new features um, in the chat experience to make sure, again, for safety purposes, uh, as well as uh, just user experience. Uh, onboarding CRM, uh, so how we, how we reach out to uh, our user base, whether that's via push or email, uh, and then uh, lastly, kind of ads and surveys for being able to kind of collect information that we might not be able to garner um, from other qualitative research. Um, so trying to be able to add that in as well. And come back to that. Um, so I wanted to touch on, since, since this is a meeting about experimentation, uh, I wanted to kind of touch on uh, our experimentation platform and kind of why we built out our own uh, proprietary platform. Uh, we call it Phoenix. Uh, and Essentially, uh, we've only recently kind of built this out, and these are a lot of the main issues that we were trying to address when we were building out our, our internal platform. Um, so we wanted, the first thing is definitely the standardization of reporting, um, so making sure that we can uh, kind of compare across tests uh, and ensure that we're consistently delivering good products uh, and, and new features that are going to be beneficial uh, to all the different demographics that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we need to be able to account for selection bias and make sure that we kind of have things like uh, built-in AA tests into every AB test uh, to ensure that even these uh, small changes are not having any sort of selection bias. Um, we, we're obviously an app where users are meeting one another, so uh, being able to handle the interactions of different uh, different features on different people's apps. Uh, so for example, if you're chatting with someone uh, and you send them a Spotify song through our integration, uh, if we're testing the Spotify integration, what happens if the other person is not in the, in the variant group there? Um, so being able to handle those sort of interactions is very important. Um, so, being, so a lot of our testing is, is short term, but being able to actually measure out those uh, measure out those effects and ensure we're not just seeing novelty from a new feature. Um, so having kind of like continuous ongoing testing uh, is very important to us as well. Um, also being able to handle multi multiple variant assignment or multiple devices, um, people delete their account, recreate their account. Um, so how do we kind of keep this consistent across um, all their various accounts and make sure that they're getting a consistent experience? and that we can rely on our data and they're not just getting continually reassigned. Um, and then also uh, pre-op and post-op. Uh, so whether there's certain parts of uh, the app where we actually don't have all the user information, maybe before they create an account. Um, and for things like GDPR, we can't actually have some of that information until they grant us permission. So being able to handle all of that and be able to uh, actually have the the proper system in place in order to handle that. Um, ramping up, uh, so when we actually do decide to roll something out or if we need to actually increase the scale of the test, um, we need to be able to handle that in a way that it won't pollute our test. Uh, that's very important. Uh, user privacy and security is always uh, our, pretty much our highest concern, um, so making sure that we are not exposing information um, in certain ways just as a result of an experiment. Um, Let's see, and then I'm going to skip app version adoption. I mean, obviously that's important, but it's it's pretty much just uh, making sure that users are on the proper app versions in order to get certain features. Um, and then one of the one of the most important ones for the statisticians in the room uh, is making sure that we have sufficient power and we're reaching statistical significance uh, within our tests. 
um, rather than just kind of reporting results um, that we, we might see uh, that might have just occurred by, by random chance. And uh, the key thing in that context is like when you're uh, taking, taking a look at results a little too early before you kind of reach significance and kind of making uh, decisions, on product decisions, a little bit too early. So we want to try to avoid that. And we wanted to make sure that we have uh, controls in place to prevent that. Um, and then lastly, kind of being able to handle traveling users and different languages and countries. Uh, obviously, in different countries, there's different languages that they speak, and those can even be different uh, kind of dialects. Uh, so being able to handle all of that and being able to segment by that is all very important to us. And then lastly, I just want to go through a case study. Uh, it's a little bit of a meta experiment that we kind of created. Uh, this is called uh, Smart Photos. And essentially, um, we created an experiment which allows users to then experiment uh, on their own uh, their own photos. So it'll kind of randomize the, the ordering in which their, their photos uh, exist, and that will then allow them to uh, be served as a, as a recommendation to other users in different orderings. And then based on the, the feedback that they actually get back, and uh, after a sufficient number of impressions, we'll, we'll then rearrange their photos for them um, in the in the order that gave them the best performance. Um, so we we actually saw that this improved uh, obviously very uh, it improves things like their people swipe right rate, uh, their match rate, uh, and the, the number of uh, likes that they, they send out, and ultimately helps people get matches and meet one another. So it was a really interesting kind of like that experiment that I thought would be interesting to share with you all. So. Um, I think that's pretty much all I have for, for today, but if you have any questions, feel free to come up to me after. I'll be hanging around. Okay, so uh, hopefully got a bite to eat. Uh, now we're going to do a segment uh, uh, by uh, Adel Ajaz, who's the founder and CEO of Split. He's going to tell a little bit about how we got here and uh, share with a model, for those who aren't familiar with the model of kind of why would you do a progressive rollout? What are the stages you go through? Otto, here you go. Hey, everybody. Uh, so, uh, Sean's talk was so interesting, uh, especially the use case that he was presenting. But judging by my picture up there, I would say we need help in person experiment that can teach me how to take a good picture. Uh, uh, but in any case, uh, so my, uh, my background real quick up there, uh, why, would you, why would you care about anything that I say? I've had the good fortune of working at some of the most leading companies in the Valley and in that industry, um, where I've had to solve some of these problems that Sonali and Sean are talking about. Um, so real quick, the, the, uh, I'm going to divide my talk into two quick parts. One is the Y experiment, um, to kind of like take a 40,000 view, and then the second uh, is to dive deeper into how to experiment, some, some best practice that I can leave you with. Um, so the point experiment part of it simply comes down to a very interesting thing, which is if you think about the best teams in our industry, uh, they're continuing to move faster and faster than ever before. Uh, two decades ago, the state of the art was Windows XP, and what you remember that, was the deliver of two years. Today, companies like Walmart Labs, companies like Tinder, uh, Snap, Netflix, these companies are deploying software hundreds of thousands of times a day uh, in many cases. And in doing so, uh, they ultimately, how are they able to do that? Right? Uh, that, that is the competition is forcing all of us to kind of imitate these, these best of breed companies. So how are they accomplishing that? Um, ultimately, the way they accomplish that is by balancing three key ideas. Speed, quality, and risk. Speed, risk, and quality. Right? Speed, how quickly you can move. Risk, how are you negatively impacting your customer's experience? As Mali was mentioning over and over again, there's like do no harm sort of tests, and the third being quality. And over there, these, the, what I've experienced through my experience at LinkedIn and then at later IQ and Yahoo is that effectively it comes down to these teams have figured out the balance between three key questions uh, building the feature on time, building the feature right, and then building the, uh, the right feature. Right? That, that's the balance. Because if you think about it, in most companies out there, the, 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 I'm not talking about the Walmart, Lots of Snaps, and the Tinder, but most companies that we work on, uh, uh, um, the, the, the time it takes to take uh, a, fee, a code that was committed to production 
has been going on for three months. Right, so they're not moving fast. Not only that, but also most of the changes that are made to production, between 45 to 60 percent of changes that are made to production, and it resulting in a failure at this time. Again, I'm not talking about these leading companies. I'm talking about the rest of us. And finally, um, something that is true for everybody, not only in this room but also across the industry, whether it's Walmart Labs or Slack, is that most of the ideas, most of our features that we ship to production have negative or neutral impact. They actually don't work, right? If you think about it, because you know, as Microsoft says, between 80 and 90 percent of features that ship to Bing have negative or neutral impact on the metrics of design. So the idea is to be well. How do we balance out this idea of building the feature on time, building the feature right? And building the right feature. Um, and ultimately, I mean, the reason why we're all here is that the answer for that question is experimentation. Experimentation lies at the heart of the successful companies, as you just heard from some of our speakers. Um, because ultimately, what, what is experimentation but a very simple idea, which is making small, frequent changes guided by data. The thing that separates it is guiding by data. Because there are other ideas, it feels delivery and all of that, that you use to make small frequent changes. But what makes experimentation different is that everything is guided by data. And here are some examples of some companies. So, for instance, Amazon deploys multiple times a second. Booking.com is able to release something to customers and then kill it in a matter of seconds or minutes uh, in case it has negative uh, impact. And Stitch Fix is continuously experimenting on, on its customers to drive monthly retention. So ultimately, the message is leading dev teams use experimentation. Do three things, iterate faster, iterate safer, iterate smaller. Because ultimately, the more you are able to do, the more you are able to impact your customers. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, step into the next part of the talk, which is leaving you with something to think about as you uh, think about experimentation, or as you think about how to launch a feature in an experimentation with the world. So, um, uh, this, talk, uh, this part of the talk is based on some of the work that we did at LinkedIn. And uh, 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 so I, I don't own uh, this. These are not my original ideas. Let's just put it out. Uh, the basic question that I want to answer in this particular uh, section of the talk is um, if you are a uh, if you are a Sonata or if you are a shop and you're trying to release a feature, um, there are multiple ways of going from the feature is dark for everybody and the feature is deployed to everybody. Right, and one of the things we noticed that they did was that the path from zero percent to hundred percent was different for different teams. Some teams were going zero to one to two to three to four, which was really wrong. Others were going zero to fifty to hundred, which is also kind of interesting. Others were going zero to ten to twenty-five to thirty-five to seventy-five to hundred. So, what is that ideal path to get from zero to hundred percent? So that's what I'm going to try to answer. Because ultimately, it comes down to how do you balance speed, risk, and quality. Uh, so real quick, um, I would recommend that uh, every, every round, every experiment or feature round should first go through five different stages. The first stage is what we call the dog footing phase. This should be, uh, this means dog footing phase that means that you release the feature or that variant, that experience, uh, to internal employees, to your PM, to your engineers, to your QA uh, team. So that we can kind of like stress test in production whether we missed something completely obvious. Right? Well, did the UI actually completely match? Did the border line was the phone size perfect? All of that. If I click this button, does it give me an error? <coughs> Basically. Uh, and that should take you about one to two days at best. That's the first one. The second is the debugging phase. Now, the debugging phase over here, the goal of the debugging phase is not to learn anything. Right? I mean, as, as Sean was saying, well, we we're trying to learn whether or not the smaller photos uh, idea is impacting people's experience or not, that's a learning exercise. But the debugging phase is not meant for learning. The debugging phase is simply, you know, mess up something royal, right? And what does messing up mean? Simply, hey, uh, am I seeing any sort of performance problems? Am I seeing any sort of obvious bugs? Uh, if I launch this beyond my employees, because your employees are, are a special group that act differently, right? If you think about the way Tinder's employees, Work, it's probably very different than the way Tinder's user base markets, right? So in this case, you try to launch a feature to between 5 to 10 percent, depending upon your skill of the job, right? Of your users. And that should also last you about one to two days. One to two days so that you can see a peak of traffic and a low of traffic. And that's when you can watch your logs, your, uh, your uh, APMs, and in case of split, you actually get this 
capability to, to actually detect if something went wrong. From there, uh, your, your learning begins, right? Now you want to know, actually, am I having a positive impact? Whereas so now we were saying, well, we want to make sure that, um, that we actually have an impact on our customers before we launch the website. To do that, the best possible thing for you to do is to directly go to 50%, right? If you have a treatment of uh, you just directly wrap up to 50%, and that's when you get the maximum possible power. What does that mean? That simply means that uh, you can learn the most from your users in the shortest possible time. Of course, you can apply very introduction techniques and all of that to make it easier, but I'm talking about like at a high level. And that should last you between one to two weeks, depending upon the traffic as well, right? Because a week is usually a good amount of time in which you see uh, your users coming in, depending on your traffic patterns, so maybe a Tinder people tend to log in over the weekends, let's assume that. Um, and then in the weekdays, say Monday evening, it's probably not that, that traffic. So you want to see the entire week happen so that you understand how you have your customers' experience. Now let's say at that point, you realize that your metrics are moving in the right direction. Then you want to move into scalability phase. So instead of going from 50 to 100%, you want to just test, test whether, you, whether your systems will actually deal with the 100% profit. Right? Maybe there's a, a, a database uh, index that might get blown through. Maybe your Kafka queues to get a stock working or whatnot. So you don't want to go from 50 to 100 right away. You want to go from 50 to 75. And again, that is something that you want to test for one peak cycle. So again, if you're Tinder, maybe your peak traffic is over the weekend. So you want to wait till that peak traffic happens uh, and, and, and stress test your system effectively from an operations perspective. And from here, you can go to oh, sorry. From here, you can go to 100% uh, and, and have a feature is launched. Or in some rare circumstances, for really large companies, you may want to do a holdout set. What does that mean? That means that you launch not to 100%, but you launch to 95%. You hold out a 5% group of people. Why do you do that? You do that because you may want to say, well, I want to hold out this group of people for an entire quarter. Now, all my experiments that I'm going to run, I'm not, they're never going to see any of those experiments. So that at the end of a quarter, I can evaluate the impact of every experiment that I ever run in this quarter and, and, and compare these people, these 5% who never saw the treatment for any experiment against, um, against, my, uh, against the, the rest of the crowd. And the goal over there is to measure, is to detect the impact of long-term learning, right? And you want to do that over the course of one or four. That's pretty wonderful. But for the vast majority of companies, just wrapped up. That was my talk. I just wanted to, the summary of my talk is effectively experimentation is not just uh, an idea where you're trying to optimize things. It's the way the best companies that in our industry, the best engineering teams in our industry do software development. It becomes the philosophy of software development in teams. And uh, uh, hopefully um, some of what I talk about is valuable to you and I hope you Thank you so much. Thank you all. That, by the way, is available as a blog post on our blog. Uh, why not? Why don't you uh, pop on up here and tell us what, what's going on at SNAP. We don't have to tell us what's going on at SNAP, but you can tell us by your talk. Well, thank you everyone for the talk. It's going to be about how to move faster and safer with the experimentation. Okay. Uh, so I have three key points that I want to mention here from a more of a technical standpoint. Uh, the first one is on metric design analysis, and uh, the second one is on how to have a good statistics and the issue of multiple testing. And the third one is specifically on learning reduction. <clears throat> so um, here, the first one is on metric design analysis. Um, as next, we have two types of metrics, right? The first one is engagement metrics, the second one is performance metrics. So um, as typical engagement metrics, because of the social network properties that we have here, um, the distribution of the count data, if you were to aggregate them together for EP tests, are normally distributed like the one on the left hand side. So it has a typical characteristic of a power law distribution, meaning that if you were to calculate the variance, it's much larger than the mean, and also, therefore, it's important to cap on extremely large values to reduce the variance from the metric. Just by itself. And another one that we prefer at Snapchat is that we want to measure uh, breadth over depth. Uh, what does that mean? It means that we want to have more people on 
on our platform instead of making the existing users more engaged. So we actually value more uh, new customers. We want people to use specific features more instead of like saying, oh, this is already a power user. And we don't really care as much as to that person uh, sending 2,000 snaps versus that person sending 5,000 snaps. And then that contributes um, dramatically different as to how the distribution looks. It's going to look a lot more on something on the right hand side, depending on how long we're running the experiment. So it has a uh, cap distribution looking like this. So um, if you were to measure the days, it's going to have this bimodal shape. And another way if you want to improve the power of the test is to convert something is measuring days into a ratio statistics. For instance, you can measure oh, how many people are actually um, like using the feature of max on Snapchat more than 80% of the days of the experiment. Uh, and the other part is on power analysis. I think Sean mentioned that already. It just means that we are so accustomed to p-values like in general. A p-value has a fundamental problem, meaning that it's defined under the, under the condition that if the null hypothesis were true, and what is the probability of observing something more extreme than we have seen so far. But power analysis comes from the alternative hypothesis standpoint, meaning that what is the what is your experiment's ability to detect some actual non-zero trigger effects <coughs> if um, it were to exist, right? So here's an equation here that gives you a basic idea of to, uh, what is the minimum number of samples uh, required in order to detect treatment effects. Here's denoted as E. And uh, the top part of the equation here is pretty much as a constant. You can think about that given the type 1 and type 2 error rate that you desire. And it's pretty much uh, depends on the variance of your test. Therefore, I mentioned that variance reduction is important. If your distribution has a large variance by nature, versus the actual treatment effects that you want to design, you want to detect. So if you want to detect some really, really small treatment effects, obviously you need larger samples. Or if your metric in general has larger variance, obviously you're going to need more samples as well. So before you conduct any experiments, it's always important <coughs> to look at the power of the metric and what are the desirable treatment effects you have in mind. So uh, that's the first part. The second part is uh, test statistics and multiple testing. And uh, you know, like in any type of statistical uh, world, you know, people are divided into two, you know, two ways of doing things. The first part is uh, the first one is frequentist. They model things like more from a from a classic way. The other one will be Bayesian. And depending on uh, the situation in your company, if you have a lot of past experiments on a specific matrix or something, I would encourage you guys to adopt an empirical based uh, Bayesian type of idea, meaning that a lot of the quantities can be estimated from your data and therefore lending power to the experiment that you run. For instance, the p-values here is defined as condition of the null hypothesis being true with the probability of doing something more extreme. And if we were to swap this, meaning that condition of the data that you see so far, what is the probability that the null hypothesis is true? And then this test statistics correspondingly turns into something called the local false discovery rate, which has this explicit form right here. And the, num the quantity here, the F0, is just a normal 0, 1 distribution after normalization. And P here, based on the past experiments on one metric, for instance, we want to measure how people, uh, how many snap sends are moved by past experiments. And this P can be estimated from your data, meaning that based on my past experiments, what is the proportion uh, of those experiments that actually move uh, my, my metric in consideration? And then this test is not only can guarantee uh, uh, against type 1 error rate that I mentioned before, it also can control type 2 error rate, it means that if you design certain powers, you have the ability to do that. And this co corresponds to something called like always valid key values in the industry at the moment as well. And uh, the second part uh, of this test of this model testing is that we want people to be aware that when you have a lot of metrics in consideration, it's important to take false discovery rates in, um, uh, in mind, meaning that people are used to just reject the null hypothesis when p-value is smaller than a fixed threshold, like say 0 0.05 or 0 0.01. And here's an A test that we have done here at Snapchat, and you can see the list of metrics, which is blurred here intentionally, and uh, there are well over like 20 or 30 of them with p-values smaller than 0 .0, 0 0.05, which should not be deemed significant just because of the nature of the test. It's an A test. But if we were to use a simple 
BH direction that's available like anywhere, uh, you, will, you will see that there are no more of these uh, metrics that are showing significance. So that's the importance of uh, taking false discovery rate into consideration. And the third part that um, also I will mention earlier is to reduce the variance when you do AB tests. Uh, if you do not have like an array of data scientists, one simple thing you can do is to just use the post-experiment metric to minus the pre-experiment metric for a fixed period of time. Like say, for my second day experiment value, you just minus the previous seven days of that person's experiment value. And this is something that in EPOM they call difference in difference. And or if you are more used to linear regression or non-linear regression or whatever, you can just simply do post-experiment metrics and regress on pre-experiment metrics. And in general, this will provide faster results for you to reach significance if there were to actually any um, treatment effects um, at hand. So this is my talk. Um, thank you very much. Right. What I want to do now is just actually have you guys talk about what's the real world for someone working in a culture that uses experimentation. And all of us talking about how, you know, um, you know Sonali, in your talk, you spoke about what probably the classic thought of, you know, you got to A-B tests, right? And you put some interesting stuff about, you do some of this to, to learn how to safely launch. So it wasn't just, I want to know the answer to this question, but also I want to roll out and watch as I roll out. So what's cool about that is on the one hand, you can say, oh, well, she was talking about classic A-B testing, but she's actually saying the same thing Alva was saying, which was that modern software companies take measures to make sure they don't do crazy stuff by flipping switch all at once when there's a lot at stake, right? So experimentation isn't just about stats to figure out which variant one, it could also be the way you roll software out. So I want to start with Tinder, just because I'm looking for a really interesting story. Uh, what is the most, so what is the, the uh, what's the favorite, most impactful, most intriguing experiment you ran, maybe the most surprising in the last year? Yeah, so we run, we run hundreds, maybe thousands of experience, uh, experiments every year. Uh, so uh, I think one of the ones that comes to mind is uh, I really like the, the tests that we have that are really kind of like small UI changes that actually have kind of like an outsized impact. Um, so uh, a, simple, a simple test that we did that I really enjoyed was kind of reordering a lot of the different profile elements that are kind of paired with your photos. Um, so if people aren't familiar with it, uh, when you use Tinder, uh, certain cards, uh, that certain images that you have will be paired with like your, your school or your job um, or your favorite song on Spotify or uh, your, your Instagram. Uh, so just kind of by uh, reordering those, we were able to kind of find uh, kind of optimal ordering for, for how we can uh, actually serve someone's recommendation to other people um, even though it's providing the exact same information as on the profile as a whole, uh, I think it is very important actually in the order in which you surface it um, and the, uh, like the, the various information that you're actually showing uh, up front, uh, kind of giving people the, uh, the, the kind of like the, the strongest information paired with their best photos um, and being able to kind of measure the, the effect of that. Um, while is just a small UI change that actually has kind of outsized impact in terms of people sending sending messages to one another, people matching with one another, um, and sending sending uh, right swipes to one another. So I think that one was one of my favorites. Okay, Smalley. I just want one of my metrics to be right swipe. <laughs> <laughs> my next career goal. <laughs> Um, one of the tests I just ran, so Walmart is very interesting because it's an omni-channel experience, so people can shop in store, they can shop online, um, they can do this buy online pickup in store, they can ship to home, like kind of classic Amazon type thing. Um, and so one of the tests we ran was around omni-channel um, experience, so to kind of get more new customers to try online grocery for the first time, uh, which is actually very hard. People don't try online grocery because they want to pick their own avocados. Uh, <laughs> and they're worried about freshness and all kinds of things. So we said, well, what if, you know, we have 50, I probably can't say these numbers, we have 5x the number of customers that shop groceries um, in the store that we do um, online. So what if we take all of those customers and what they bought in store and like welcome them when they come to the site uh, using, we have a 
we have a Walmart credit card and we have a Walmart pay service, so we can link them with their credit card. Um, so we said when they show up on the site, let's welcome them with items that they bought in the store before, and maybe that will drive conversion. Maybe they'll try on the grocery for the first time, um, and it works. We, we were very worried about the creepy factor, especially in like, right. this world of it's been a jury's I issue. Do you want more of that? You bought five of them last week. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Uh, but I think luckily we sell groceries, so people are forgiving. Uh, so if we just show you some things that you bought before, uh, it's kind of crazy how that convenience just like pushes you over the hump and gets you to try out that groceries. And so just, just to recap that, so they, you took what they bought in brick and mortar, yep. and you said, do you want to buy this again? On the website. Right here, just click a button. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, and so and we're now in the process of doing product marketing in the stores actually to say, you know, for the people who are shopping in, in, in stores to try online. And so uh, they'll be welcomed with these items, yeah. So my personal experience was that I, I also went through the process of um, online grocery is not something I would do. But then we had a second kid, and then we changed up that. So <laughs> I'm really open minded about the groceries just showing up. So given you guys know about diaper buying patterns and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one, you have, you have a story you want to tell about sort of favorite experiment or, or weirdest, even weirdest story, like surprise or whatever. Yeah, I'm not sure if I can talk like more in detail about the specific part, like Fair enough. that we have. Um, but probably everybody already knows that Snapchat undergone a uh, pretty major Android app redesign um, earlier this year. Uh, one interesting thing that I think would be a blessing to the guys that attended here is that um, we observe quite different um, treatment effects as to, you know, when we launched this app, when we were doing A-B tests, um, you know, like the different metrics um, that we're interested in, one of the core metrics reacted very differently for different user demographics. So, you know, some users were really having a negative impact for some reason, and while the others are having an overall really positive impact. And so it's really important to look at these heterogeneous treatment effects, you know, either, you know, by country level or gender and sexual orientation in your case, or some other ones, and just to understand that what is the feature launch, actually how is it impacting that specific group of people, instead of just looking at everything as a whole. I guess that would be less So if you'd mushed them all into an average, you would have lost all that data. Yeah. Right? Yeah. On the whole, it's looking okay ish. While there's these raving fans and these very unhappy people. Right? Well, yeah, it depends on the goal that you want to achieve. But, you know, if you are really jeopardizing some key customers, and by you, essentially in a Navy test, you're treating each and every customer the same way because they only count once, right? But that might not be the case for your business. And therefore, I think it's important to look at that more in depth. Cool. OK. Um, so if you're giving advice, uh, I'm going to try to sum up random in this and go back to Sean, actually. If you're giving advice to someone who's eager to start with experimentation, let's say they've heard about this before, they thought that you had to you know, only be in some giant dot com to have access to this, but now there's other ways to do it, right? What, what would you tell them? We give advice to start, or, or, or how to look at it, or how to kind of get their head around it. Uh, yeah, so I feel like it's, it's definitely important to have like a, a really strong uh, stats background, or at least someone that is, is well versed in it. Um, not to say that it's necessarily required um, to kind of understand and experiment on your user base, but I think it is really important to kind of understand all the little nuances or ways that experiments could go wrong. Um, how different biases could be introduced um, in order, so in order uh, to not fall victim to a lot of the pitfalls that I had mentioned um, at the, the end, of my, end of my slides there. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of very common problems you can run into, and I think uh, if you kind of just jump right into it and you don't necessarily have um, sort of understanding of how experimentation works, um, even something as simple as like a t-test can go uh, incredibly wrong. Um, so you just need to be very careful um, about how you're a interpreting the results and b how you're designing the experiment. Well, by the way, I'll make a prediction that by this time next year there will be one or two really good books that actually help people figure that out, get to speed up that knowledge. Like, what are the things they should definitely know already happen? They should watch out for. So watch, watch the space. Um, Audible, uh, uh, 
Uh, do you want to go back to something that happened at either Edmonton or really like do an interesting story, something a wacky, crazy thing that happened? I kind of like the story Pato tells about the person who didn't believe in future flags and then yeah, I'm going all in her face for this. I think I'll tie it to the other question that you were asking, which is what if people are getting started on this, what they need to, um, what, 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 what would be my advice? I think a couple of things I would say, and I'll tie it to the story as well. Um, a couple of things I'd say is that I understand that um, in the beginning there's going to be resistance. Uh, because fundamentally, to experiment, you have to be willing to admit that you're wrong. Uh, because if you if you are either in a culture, you yourself as a, if you're a leader in your team, a product manager, whatnot, um, and you're not willing to admit that um, you know your idea did not really work out, um, then you can uh, no matter how much data you look at, you'll find ways to justify it. Uh, because ultimately, uh, as Ben was showing, uh, uh, that sometimes uh, metrics move um, simply purely by chance. And, and, and if you don't have good um, hygiene about it, people can justify launching a feature just because that other metric moved. Uh, and they're like, yeah, sure, you know, the, the thing that I wanted to see did not happen, but look, this other thing happened, and so let's keep on going. So I think the, the, the biggest thing I would say is that be, be prepared um, uh, and have the humility to understand that most ideas actually are, don't work out. Um, so that's one, and the example, and, and, and and in the beginning, you're going to have resistance. So I'll give the example of when, when, when I built a solution for Elite IQ, I had the hardest time getting it adopted. Why? Because I did not have the support of anybody in my team. Um, eventually, I convinced my boss uh, that let me try this. Um, and he said, you, have, you can build this over the course of a week. Uh, and if you can build it, that's it. That's all the time you get. So I built it over the course of a week. Uh, and then he said, you get to do one training um, of, of the entire engineering team, not more than that. Because, you know, we're moving fast, we don't have time to waste and all that. So I did one training. Um, but then after that, you know, people were still not buying it, I was using it myself. And then eventually I convinced one engineer, uh, and then second engineer to put one feature, second feature, third feature behind it. Inevitably, uh, what I was betting on was what happened. Uh, that engineer, uh, inevitably brought the site down because of a, a feature that they were rolling out. Luckily, the, he was running around being like, shit, shit oh, I'm sorry, like, shoot, I, I brought the site down, I brought the site down, and, you know, a young engineer, first, second job, really concerned about his own job now. And so I told him, hey, did you put it behind uh, a split or an experiment? And he said, yes. And I said, go ahead, push the kill button. And he pushed the kill button, and then the, uh, the site came back in 30 seconds. And that experience, then it's felt like a lot of fun. Now, it's not, he didn't learn anything, did that feature actually have a positive impact or not, but we saved his ass. And that effectively sometimes is the way that, you, that, you, that, that these things work. So, that's just my advice. Number one, um, have humility. Number two, have the, per, uh, have the patience to push, push your ideas from the organization. How did your organization get into experimentation? Was it from the start, like, you know, uh, uh, like if I'm looking at Tinder and Snap, I'm thinking they're sort of very modern era, hyperscale. Like, was there always a thought about experimentation or did it come along at some point? Um, like, what, 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 uh, neither one of you sort of feels like you got, you want to jump in? Um, I think, I mean, experimentation has always been scientifically important. But there's always this debate between human judgment and experimentation, right? And you know, sometimes when, people, uh, when executives, like VPs or SVPs, think that the features will definitely work and will definitely, you know, improve our user experience for all these revenues, yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually, it was just so negative. But you know, even when the experiment is showing the fact that it's causing negative impact, and they will call that as well an error. And then it's efficient to act, it's actually important to realize you know, the value of the experiment, even like to let this type of error happen, you know, to let it be rolled out and see the actual impact, see the neg negative user, be, you know, user engagement declining or something to realize that it's actually important to run experiment and believe data and believe in statistics. How, how many people are moving for the term HIPAA? Uh, 
highest paid person's opinion. So it, it basically is that somebody who says, well, I'm in charge, or I, whatever, could be that I think it's Mark's person, or whatever, but like when teams are driven by, hippos tend to trample things. Um, and uh, experimentation is a way to actually say, okay, maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong, let's find out. Let's do, well, you say that's what we gotta do, so let's bet the business on that and figure out. Uh, so, uh, Melissa, what do you think? Should we do Q&A for the audience? Yeah, so uh, maybe we've got another wireless mic. Melissa, if you wanna, you just raise your hand and Melissa will bring you the mic, and you guys can ask us if anyone. Yeah, I first of all, I'm grateful for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Melissa Lowe, and this question is for, I suppose, anyone who wants to answer, maybe a specialist in Ali. But my question is, how long do you typically do A-B testing for? And is it always by time, or do you ever also do it by uses, or login, or whatever it is to be? Uh, so like, for a feature launch, like how long would the test be running? Is that your question? Yeah. Yeah, it depends on where it is. So if it's on like, the home page, uh, that's where most of our traffic goes. It could, we could run a test for two weeks. Uh, depends on how long it takes basically to get enough statistical significance or not. Um, so we do track assessments, which I'm sure they can speak to more specifically. But generally, like the homepage test, you can run in a week or two uh, at Walmart. Some things like deeper in the funnel, maybe like your favorites experience or something like that. Uh, maybe only half traffic goes there. So you have to kind of get that into account. Those take four weeks, three to four weeks for us. Uh, I imagine the scale of Tinder and Snapchat is much different. Uh, so maybe you guys run experiments for a day, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, that's typically what we see. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so uh, I think I can echo a lot of the same sentiments. Is it really depends on like what part of the funnel that we're talking about. If we're trying to move like a chat metric, then obviously the people that are chatting every day is probably going to be much smaller than the number of people that are opening the app every day. Um, so we'll we'll kind of take um, we'll we'll do the, the power analysis ahead of time to determine like the necessary sample size and determine how how long is it going to take for us to get uh, X amount of views or impressions or users into that part of the funnel. Um, and then we'll run the test for, for that long. So I think, I think generally it's, it's all uh, the same across the board. Cool, I think okay. Do you ever think about the, the impact that, the impact on the users of having like things changing around? Like I was talking to a friend about uh, Facebook that, you know, we were, we were talking about the fact that our, our icons on the bottom were just like every week were, were changing. And one week there was five icons, one week there was four and six, and you know, and it's uh, it's really kind of unnerving. Like you, you as a user, you, you feel like you don't have control over your experience. Is that something that you um, you think about, or or how do you handle that? Yeah, so our experimentation platform, if you opt into, if you're opted into an experiment, you stay in the experiment. So whether you're signed in or signed out, we use a cookie and we'll just keep you in the experiment. So that's one way we help with that. Um, so like, while a test is running, you won't be in both control and variation. Uh, but I think it's something that's valid. Uh, I think another way to also think about the challenge is uh, a lot of times there's just straight like adoption of a new feature from the standpoint of like someone getting used to it uh, that is something that you might want to account for and how long you run the test. So uh, certain features, you show it to them, it's a slam dunk the first time they see it. It's definitely going to beat the production experience, but certain things you want them to see like two or three times because you think it's such a new thing for them, but you believe that if they see it a few times, they actually will adopt it in a positive way. Um, so. Sometimes when we, when we launch some radical things, we'll, we'll, we'll check for that and we'll account for that in our timing. Um, doesn't directly answer your question, but I don't know if you guys have a response. Yeah, I, I think we, we very highly value design uh, and how people actually use, use our user app. So uh, we'll definitely factor in uh, things like having things change very frequently um, and trying to keep things consistent um, in general locales is generally also something that's important to us because maybe uh, a lot of people actually do like to use Tinder with their friends. Um, so it, it's kind of a weird experience if the person next to you has uh, access to a feature that you don't. So being able to uh, be able to segment your population either by locale or something like that is, is also something that we, we would do to conduct tests uh, in a way that would keep the experience consistent or at least try to. I think the, 
the one thing that I would say is that, uh, or two things I would say, is that it is common when, when speakers talk about experimentation is because um, uh, it is easy to give examples that are more user visible, right? So when you look at every example that any of the speakers gave, they were very user visible examples. Uh, but the reality is most of your, stuff, your software, your application, your Facebook application is like an iceberg. There's a layer above the water, and there's a huge layer above, uh, below the water, right? And that entire layer is your body, right? And most of the experiments that are actually going on are not necessarily that user visible. There's a lot that is changing in the background as well, uh, that the user may not intuitively see or actually notice, um, but it changes their behavior, which then raises ethical questions, uh, yada, 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 that I'm not going to get into. Uh, but while, while, yes, it is, it can be a little bit of a, my experience is changing um, uh, 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 visually a lot, but the reality is your experience is changing practically every day, every week. Uh, you gave the example of Facebook. It is probably changing every day under the hood without you even realizing it. So what you see is just a tip of the iceberg. Uh, it does raise other questions uh, as to whether it's ethically right to do it or uh, another question for me, please. Hi. Uh, this question is a personality. Uh, so, in that example you shared, uh, you sort of showed sort of showed how you tweak the UI to uh, examine the, uh, the outcome on uh, user behavior. And I was kind of wondering how you kind of decided on those changes and whether you worked with you know, the UI design team to make those changes and um, and how that kind of discussion played out because if there's a little bit of nuance to to those different uh, screens. Yeah, so usually when an experiment is negative, it's like SOS in the little sort of pretty intense meeting between design, analytics, product, and the relevant leadership. And it's like, what's going on? What are our top hypotheses as to why this is happening? Because uh, Specifically at Walmart, we do like we do pretty intense planning around what features we choose. We should try to choose the right features. And so when something is negative, we're all very kind of worried because of the time that's been spent. So uh, usually, you know, it's negative. I'm peeking at it, which I shouldn't be peeking. Uh, trying to predict what's going to happen, and then finally, my analyst is like, "You can read the data now." Uh, <laughs> and, and then if it is still negative, yes, we do work with design uh, and analytics and product leadership to kind of come up with a list of hypotheses. In this case, um, people were quite convinced actually that it was a bug, because uh, homepage bounce often just is because the app's not loading. Um, and so we had to do some pretty like detailed due diligence before we went out with another variant uh, to say it wasn't a bug. Um, and one of the things that, I don't know if Split does this, but we, we can't um, currently like Split the number of uh, errors that occur, like 404s or anything, in control versus variation. I think that would be an awesome feature. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I couldn't say yeah, definitively. That, that's fun, right? You're like, yeah. well, there's lines going wrong. We don't know that going wrong for the new people or the people that have the old thing that we'd like to know. Is, exactly, oh, yeah. We can figuring out, we'll see if we can find what we think we're. By the way, anytime you go looking for what you're trying to find, you might find it, but you may be no closer to actually knowing the truth, because if you go looking for what you want to find, it's observer bias. You're going to find things that, you, that didn't happen, actually. Right, so, so yeah. looking at hoc is, is messy, which is why you're experimenting in the first place. Discipline, hypothesis, yeah. and peak. Uh, so I think the role of a product manager at that point is actually to be very clear about what our hypotheses are. Um, and why we think those are happening. Um, it's well, not as much about like being right or wrong, but kind of structuring a group of people that are kind of yelling at each other about what they think is going wrong, and just being like, well, I think what you're saying is that the hypothesis is this. And then based off you know, what the group thinks is the top couple, um, I, I chose what I thought was the most promising, in my opinion, and, and then we went after it. Uh, so it's more about sort of having a different democratic conversation. If you rewind the, the beginning of this question, I think, I almost think part of what you said was, well, it sounded like these guys are making this change without consulting design, which I'm sure is not the case, right? That, that, no. That, that 
Right. I, well, I just I was wondering what the, that interaction was like. Started. Obviously, the design was very involved in the variants before you ever launched the experiment. Right? They came yes. Up yeah. I, I I like to think I function in a unit of a product manager, an analyst, and a designer, um, and an engineer, obviously. <laughs> Uh, so yes, they're very involved. So after the kind of the initial test, uh, you know, you've got the results, then you have a sort of meeting with including design and then sort of brainstorm about possible variables that could be introduced. And yeah. That's kind of how you go to the next phase. Yeah, actually the second variation, if you notice the icons were filled in, um, that's very much a design one thing. Um, material design on Android says that icons need to be filled in, as opposed to on iOS, they're like um, outlined. So if they were like, you messed up in the first place, they should have been filled in. Uh, and so that's why we went with that. Thank you. Cool, thank you. Thank you guys for those questions. That, that's a great way to run. So, so uh, yeah, definitely thanks to the panel. Some of you travel in the midst of crazy SFO stuff. So thanks again for all the panel for coming, you guys. I hope you enjoyed the interaction with people in the wild. Uh, and uh, with that, we'll wrap. Thanks again, everybody.